Good morning. My name is Randy Melzi, and I'm the senior director in charge of public policy programs and the and corporate relations here at the America Society Council of the Americas. It is my pleasure to welcome members of the America Society Council of the Americas, special guests and friends. Thank you for joining us today and also thank you to everybody who is watching on the webcast this morning. We're honored to have all of you here with us this morning and excited about the opportunity to hear the remarks of the three chief economists of FIEL, Daniel Artana, Juan Luis Bur, and Santiago Urbistondo. I would like to thank you for joining us here again at the Council of the Americas for the 11th year. And our guest speakers will be discussing Argentina's economic outlook, prospects for growth for the country and its fiscal performance. First, Juan Luis Bur will give a presentation on the economic slowdown, inflation, and nominal anchors. And then Santiago Urbistondo will do a, have a, make a presentation on the costs of public utility regulation. And finally, Daniel Artana will present the fiscal policy and perspectives. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to a terrific discussion after the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you to all for being here. Uh, I will uh, introduce this uh, uh, presentation with uh, the evolution of the, the economy, the real economy of Argentina. For the past uh, five years, uh, growth experienced high volatility in the country. Uh, average uh, growth for the past five years was around 3.7%. Uh, at the same time, inflation ran uh, very high at over 20%, consider December uh, mark. And this year will probably not be quite different with an, uh, we estimate uh, GDP growth uh, below 2% and uh, inflation uh, above 23-24%. Uh, uh, during the, this uh, period, uh, this last five years, uh, the sectors that experienced uh, the highest uh, growth were uh, the financial sectors, the financial services, with a rate of growth, average rate of growth for the past five years of 11%, which is uh, quite high. Uh, transport and communications, uh, around 10%, and some services. At the same time, production, producer of goods uh, had a very a weak evolution with a decline in uh, value added by mining, uh, no growth in agriculture, and very low growth in construction and manufacturing. Uh, several sectors were uh, affected by last year's uh, evolution and decisions uh, to, to, to affect uh, exchange rate uh, operations. Looking uh, at the quarterly evolution of GDP, in fact, we have some deceleration by the end of 2011, then going to a decline of GDP in the second quarter. Uh, GDP uh, show a 1% decline in the second quarter of the year and no growth in the third and fourth quarter, the second, the second half of the year. We expected some recovery, in fact, for the, for the second half of the year, but it didn't materialize. And in fact, during the first uh, quarter of this year, we are projecting uh, just 1% growth. The, the government will say something like uh, 2%, perhaps. Uh, we are projecting 1% uh, growth this year with some uh, positive evolution of the services sector and negative evolution of goods, uh, like it uh, happened in the past uh, four quarters, uh, the evolution of uh, uh, goods uh, partly compensated by the evolution of services. Uh, if you look more uh, closely to, to the, the sectors, I mean the, the supply side, we have some, the best performers are, uh, as, as usual last year, uh, the financial sector and transport and communication, and the other sectors, uh, mainly those producers of goods and some services sectors, uh, with uh, a negative evolution or a no growth situation. Uh, the case of negative evolution for mining, uh, manufacturing uh, and construction. 
and uh, some uh, zero evolution or negative evolution for uh, commerce sectors and, and other uh, services sector. These sectors were strongly affected by the decision to uh, restrict uh, foreign exchange operations, uh, especially the case of construction. Uh, let me sh let me just uh, mention the, the one thing which is uh, I think is important for the evolution of construction. Restrictions to operate foreign exchange have led to a, a halt of uh, many real estate operations, and with this, uh, the, this led to a decline in prices of uh, property. At the same time. Uh, the cost of construction is going uh, is uh, going with the inflation. So the relation between the price of the asset, in this case the price of property, and the cost of construction, which is the cost of recovery of the asset, this relation has been declining. And when you have this decline in this relation, which is a proxy of uh, Tobin's Q ratio uh, between the, the the market asset price and the cost of uh, replacement of the of the asset. When this relation falls, you don't have incentives to, to, to build a, a, new, uh, a new house. So uh, the, the, the construction sector is in a, in, a, in a weak position and we think this situation will prevail for, for the rest of the year and even for the next two years if these exchange rate restrictions persist. Uh, from the demand side, uh, going to the demand side, uh, we have a negative evolution of investment and a weak evolution of uh, consumption, uh, especially private consumption, in the past uh, quarters. Uh, from the demand side, let me stress first the evolution of trade. Trade will not be a very important uh, asset for, for recovery this year. Uh, here you have prices. I, I first want to mention the evolution of the volume of trade expected for this year. We are not projecting a strong recovery of the volume of exports uh, because some recovery in uh, primary exports will be compensated by a very weak evolution of industrial and especially manufacturer origin industri industrial uh, exports and uh, energy exports. So uh, the volume of exports we project to be around about the same of last year. And what about prices? Prices helped very much the, the economy and the terms of trade were in the third and fourth quarter last year the highest for decades, in fact, for, for, for several decades. Uh, but these prices began to, to fall in the first quarter of the year, and, of and you know that uh, commodity prices, especially uh, food and agricultural products, are going down. So we project this year a, a decline in terms of trade of around 6.5% uh, this year, and an additional decline next year. So uh, the, 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 the export side will not be a strong uh, support for recovery this year. Uh, of course, in this scenario, you, don't, you cannot expect uh, a solid expansion of employment. Uh, in fact, uh, private employment is not growing at all uh, since uh, mid of uh, last year. Uh, so uh, let's uh, turn to the other, the other, the, the point of uh, consumption. Consumption will not grow very much. Private consumption, and the, the explanation is related partly to the evolution of uh, inflation and the policy of the of the government. The government uh, has been using uh, nominal anchors to stop inflation in the past. Uh, to try to stop inflation, in fact. Uh, the exchange rate, you have here the exchange rate devaluation. Devaluation was around uh, 5% in the year 2010. It, raised to, it increased to 6% on average in the year 2011. Uh, they have adjusted uh, the, the inflation pace of, the, sorry, the, the pace of devaluation by mid of last year to over 16, 17%, and by now they are running at 19 or 20%. So the exchange rate is no longer 
a nominal anchor for prices. On the other hand, uh, the, the, the prices of uh, regulated, regulated prices, uh, including tariffs of some uh, public services, have also been abandoned as a general anchor for, for prices. Uh, by mid-2010, uh, 2011, uh, regulated prices ran at 16% per year inflation, uh, the figure for the last uh, part of uh, 2012 was 27 percent. So, uh, regulated prices uh, are no longer another anchor of inflation. So, the government decided to, inc uh, to, to use uh, wages as an anchor. Uh, the, the, the decision was, uh, was uh, related also to the introduction of a price freeze uh, in February, early February this year, because in order to convince trade unions uh, to accept uh, wage hikes below inflation, it was necessary to, well, to reduce expect expectations of inflation. So the government introduced this price freeze by February, first deciding that the price freeze was for two months, then, not surprisingly, extending this price freeze to nine months until October, because we have the elections. Uh, in fact, we have some reduction of inflation. Uh, inflation has uh, been uh, reducing from 25 to something like 22 and a half percent. This is the, the current the current rate. Uh, but the consequence of having uh, wages as an anchor is that uh, real wages are no longer growing at the rate it used to grow. The U uh, real wages grow, uh, were used, used to grow at 8-10% uh, per year. They are now growing around 1% uh, or about uh, nothing. This is the, what you see at this, uh, I think it's the green line here, uh, the, 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 the projection for the first quarter. As employment is not growing at all, not very much, so the wage bill, the wage bill in real term, which is a combination of uh, employment plus uh, wages, is showing very low expansion this year compared to the last year. You can see that the wage bill has experienced high volatility in the past years, but with uh, very high rates of expansion in some periods that uh, impulsed uh, the consumption. Uh, we are just here, you are here, and uh, the prospects for the next quarter is that this uh, wage bill will uh, maintain very, very low. So we project uh, a low expansion, a uh, weak expansion of uh, private consumption this year and some uh, rise of uh, conflicts, uh, increase of labor conflicts in the second half of this year and of course for the next year. Well, thank you very much. Now we start. Okay, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, thanks to the Council for having us again. It's a pleasure for me to be here. My talk this morning will be on some, uh, I would say, known features of regulatory policy in Argentina, but also trying to quantify uh, its effects. So, um, in order to have uh, the, the evaluation of this policy, let's first consider what would be something uh, call it best practice, although there is no such a model of best, unique best practice uh, up to the details. Yet, uh, consensus among uh, academics and practitioners uh, distinguish some features that uh, characterize good practice, such as a clear division of public and private roles regarding the regulation of public utilities, the promotion of competition and the limitation of direct regulation to monopolies, um, who could use market power uh, and distort uh, allocation of resources. Uh, the provision through tariffs and other mechanisms of incentives for the efficient operation of, of providers, sharing over time the gains from this operation to cons with consumers, and in order to do that, combine the two things, uh, avoiding myopic perspective, that is, considering the long-run consequences of, of um, policy measures. And all this in context of transparency, professionalism, uh, institutional credibility building, so that <coughs> capital costs can be reduced and, 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 the, and the decisions are, are well thought of and, uh, and, and, and not, 
not uh, stop. Now, in Argentina, over the last 10 years, uh, there are many, many uh, <coughs> um, underperformances regarding this, this uh, dimensions. First, uh, it's not correctly focalized. So the regulation has been spread outside natural monopolies, preventing competition in some points, even in regulated industries where some segments had strong competition. That competition has been mostly stopped by uh, assigning contracts in different, in diff different mechanisms, not through competition. Uh, the institutions, the political uh, intervene, uh, uh, regulatory bodies, uh, regulation is not anymore uh, decided on, on technical uh, grounds, but politically uh, control. Um, we have seen expropriations, uh, termination of contracts, creation of or, or uh, through confiscated or expropriated firms or new firms that have roles that are confused with those of regulators such as ENARSA or YPF, not only having to be f uh, firms in the market, but with some extra uh, roles as, as um, uh, <coughs> covered uh, regulators. In terms of transparency, uh, the emergency law in, from 2002 has been extended every year. Uh, decisions are not made through public hearings or consultations. Uh, um, and, and are in a way unpredictable. And regarding tariffs, uh, they, this is perhaps the most discussed feature, but it's not the only relevant one, of course, is that tariffs have been kept <coughs> at very low levels after inflation that has accumulated around 300% uh, over the, the last 12 years. Um, <coughs> regulated prices have been kept frozen or allowed to increase s slightly. And also, not only, uh, I mean, the, the regulated tariffs have been combined with increasing subsidies. Subsidies are defined in, in a cost plus way. Uh, so if, if these subsidies are needed to cover costs, then they are uh, considered. Otherwise, uh, they are not. And, and the amount depends on the cost of the firms. And some uh, movement around social tariffs, but no relevant one, and not in any case uh, uh, well, well defined. So, this is overall a policy that is discretional, we could call it command and control, uh, that is short run oriented, that it's been discriminated, all the new capital, new investments have to be paid for, but all the investments that uh, they, they are considered to have been recovered already and they don't need to be paid anymore. But all this helps uh, and, and hurts incentives to invest and to attain productive efficiency. That's a theory, okay? That's, that's what, what is a common sense, uh, uh, something agreed upon uh, among uh, students of these, these topics. Now, the thing is, is this true? This, this happened or not? And in fact, we see that uh, uh, over the f first few years, uh, the results of this policy were, were okay. Um, there was a good and encouraging results, uh, basically because the investments accumulated until 2002 and uh, the stop, you know, the, the recession and, and the re reduction in demand allowed for a ground for <coughs> uh, attending uh, demand for public utilities without any, any major problems. Uh, other than that, of course, firms uh, losing money and, um, and their, their uh, creditors and lenders as well. But the problem began once demand started to grow back, let's say from 2005 on, and then new investments were required. Because w f with those new investments, either high uh, tariffs had to be uh, lifted or uh, new subsidies were called for. And we see regarding subsidies, this includes uh, transportation, energy, and uh, <coughs> uh, water, and sanitation, and, and goes from the 80s to 2013, first two months. And the growth you see on, on the left side is on uh, dollars, $35 million, uh, billion dollars, and here is the percentage of GDP. So in 2012, it reached over 4% of GDP 
and about $20 billion, the amount of subsidies uh, directed to these three uh, areas. Okay? The prospects for this year, of course, is a very short period to, to make a projection, but the first two months are explosive. You, we don't know if it's some accounting thing that, that some of the costs uh, of subsidies from these two first months in 2013 are in fact due for, um, should have been uh, attributed to 2012. But the thing is that this is, uh, the, the, the growth from 2005 on has been explosive. So, <clears throat> then what happened? Have uh, uh, didn't have certainty of, on the results, on, on the um, uh, funds, on the revolution, um, the quality started to deteriorate. And here are three examples of that. One <coughs> is uh, on uh, urban passenger railways, and you see that from here, first, the running distance, the, in red, are the evolution between 2000, uh, 2001 and 2010. So there is a reduction in the running distance of trains. There's a steeper reduction in the number of seats. Uh, there is a reduction on speed. There is a, uh, an increase in, in delay or cancel trains uh, in, in the number of passengers per train in per wagon and the number of injuries. So contrary to what had been the evolution in the previous five years from, from 1960, uh, 1996 to 2001, we see a reversion in, in, the, in the quality and the negative uh, evolution over the last decade. And the last data we have is 2010 because public statistics are, are delayed two years in this service. Another example are with uh, in the energy sector and the evolution of uh, generation capacity at the wholesale market with a stagnation, a stagnated uh, capacity between 2001 to 2007, which even though it was resumed later on, this gap, this included a problem with the attendant uh, higher demand later on, even, even after growth here because the, the capacity the, the, uh, was, was exhausted. And regarding natural gas reserves, the reduction from 2000 on has been profound at, 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 at an 8% plus annual rate of reduction. And then the last example I have here, because of short time, is uh, on the downstream indicators for natural gas, where we have that the annual rate in, of increase in, of number of residential users connected to the grid has slightly decreased between what was the case in the 90s and the 2000s, okay? Their consumption has grown, so each one, even though there are a few rate of increase, the, the rate of increase in consumption has increased, so each one is consuming, increasing their consumption more than they were before. And at the, regarding transportation and distribution, the rate of growth of coverage uh, in terms of capacity to transportation and, and, and coverage distance of coverage of the of distribution grid, again, is a lower uh, growth now than, than the previous decade, much lower. But perhaps more, uh, less known, more surprisingly, I guess, is the feature that because of the way the subsidies are given up, out, so that is the cost plus mechanism, investment and operation costs are incentivized to, in to increase. And then we have that despite the fact <coughs> that uh, tariffs most of the times are lower than they were a decade ago uh, or in the 90s, uh, the total cost per user is higher. So you can see that also in three examples. Here with Aerolíneas Argentinas, the average cost per passenger. When we look at tariffs, the, the tariff in 2012, the average tariff per passenger is twice what it was in 1998, okay? This is, in, this is US dollars. Uh, part of this is because higher cost of fuel, okay? 
but no more than 30% because the incidence of, of fuels on, on total cost of, of, of this service. But once you add subsidies per user, it's not that it's double, it's triple, okay? So tariffs plus subsidy per user, per passenger, has triple. If you look at this other example with the water sanitation service in Greater Buenos Aires, also, <coughs> as in the case of Aerolíneas Argentinas, this, in this case was a concession up to 2006 that was terminated that year. After termination, what you see is that, sorry, uh, is that although tariff has been reduced up to 40% of what it was in 2001 with a sl slight increase last year, once you add subsidy, instead of being a cheaper service, it's much more expensive. It's more than twice per user the cost of the service, okay? And then the last example with uh, uh, <coughs> trains, passenger trains. Again, tariffs are much lower, less than half than the, what they were in 2001, but subsidies, which started increase right after uh, the, the emergency, the, the crisis in 2001-2002 makes the service to be more than 150% more expensive adding subsidies and tariffs in 2011 than, than they were. That is a discussion here because these are, it's a reduction. Part of this, the green line says, is, is due to the to the transference of, of a subway to the city of Buenos Aires and 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 the fact is that uh, th there, is, there is an argument here that, that the green line is the correct one because this line supposes, uh, I mean, it has to be combined with information that there is a 200% increase in the first two months of subsidies given to this sector in 2013 regarding 2012. So that's something that might be revised in, in, the, in, the, in the statistics in the future. Okay, so <coughs> to... The, all I said is a brief examples. There are some other examples where some investments were performed uh, if, with this money, as in water and sewerage, that were not performed in, in, in the early 2000s. Or there is some uh, improvements in the, in the performance of Aerolíneas Argentinas that, that I have not commented on because official data is not available. But the general picture, I could provide another, other examples of uh, deterioration of quality, indicators of deterioration of quality, uh, is, 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 is the, I think, the, the, the most uh, comprehensive description uh, of, a, of, a, of the thing is that, that after the uh, first period where regulatory policies, the changes, did not show uh, significant costs, Today, we are characterized by more expensive and worse services than a decade ago. And this is even without considering a hidden cost, the fact that sunk investments and, and firms losing money today, for instance, distribution, electricity and natural gas companies, um, this is not accounted for here, not the recovery in the remuneration of sunk capital that, that at some point will be needed. Uh, many questions open for the future. Who will may be made responsible for this state of things? Uh, who will tell the truth? Who will lead the normalization in the future? Where the, will there be a normalization? What type of normalization? You know, where to go from here? Um, th those are open questions, and I don't want to <laughs> provide the answer here, but my conviction is that uh, unless we don't uh, make sure that we understand that this was a costly experience, that this is not a desired experience, that, that this has accumulated costs to be, to be uh, acknowledged in the future. Without that, um, we cannot expect a solution to be, to be forward. So uh, first step is to <laughs> have this in mind and then think of solutions. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Randy for inviting us to be here. Uh, what I will try to do in about 10, 12 minutes is uh, to review briefly uh, the evolution of fiscal policy and then try to wrap up so that we uh, move uh, to the Q&A session. Uh, you know that uh, most of uh, 
South America enjoyed an improvement in the external position thanks to uh, the increase in export prices relative to import prices. What, that is what we economists call uh, terms of trade. You see there that was a, a particularly favor South America in the green line there because for Mexico or Central America the situation is different. In fact, for Central American countries because of their oil dependency, uh, they are in, in they receive bad news from abroad. In the case of, of, of South America, uh, as we are exporters of commodities, uh, well, basically we enjoy the commodity boom. The second thing is that that's uh, now in uh, this more general thing. I now in this graph I try to focus on, on Argentina. What you have in in uh, that violet line is uh, in a 40 year period the evolution of the relation of the ratio of the price of exports to the price of imports and uh, uh, that's measured on the left axis and on the other axis is something that is also very important in this case for Argentine manufacturing which is the relative size at current dollars of the Brazilian economy to uh, the size of the Argentine economy. Why? Because our most uh, important export market for manufacturing is Brazil and you see there that that uh, ratio uh, is the most favorable in 40 years. Both things, the terms of trade that were also very favorable in a, in, at the beginning of the 70s, but when you combine both things, this is the most favorable external position that we had in the last four decades. So we were very lucky in Argentina. Uh, the farmers were very lucky to receive uh, a bonus from international prices of soybeans, corn, wheat, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we, our manufacturers, were very lucky because our most important export market is today about uh, five to six times larger than Argentina, when the normal ratio in the past was two and a half, three times larger. When you have such a, a, a bonus from abroad, uh, you know that uh, many economists advocate for a prudent uh, administration of that bonus with respect to the impact on the fiscal accounts. And that's not uh, an invention from economists. You have that the Chileans, for example, uh, in, uh, under a socialist uh, government run by former president uh, Ricardo Lagos, they decided that the prudent way to approach this, this bonus because of the volatility of commodity prices, because the things cannot last forever, uh, is to have uh, what they call a structural surplus, okay? That they, a government runs a surplus because they enjoy a bonus because this tends to favor economic growth and also most of these activities and in the case of Argentina through export taxes, in the case of Chile through, through the profits of, of the public mining company, help to improve uh, fiscal accounts. Well, uh, and the other thing is that you are supposed to uh, have uh, 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 an external surplus too. In fact, Argentina had that, what we call the twin surpluses, okay, As a, they are measured as a fraction of GDP in red. You have the fiscal position of the federal government and the provincial governments, and in green you have the current account surplus, which is the, the surplus of external surplus, uh, so to speak. We have that for a period of time, but as you see there, we lost that. And in fact, uh, in the fiscal position, if you measure that properly, uh, the combined position of the federal government and the provincial government uh, last year was a deficit of about 4.5% of GDP. Uh, it's true that Argentina's debt after the debt restructuring is relatively low, but uh, this dimension has not been prudent in the sense that compared to that prudent rule that I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, uh, in fact Argentina should be running a surplus because it's enjoying a, a very favorable external situation that we don't know if they will last forever. And in the external surplus, the current account position, you see there that we have a tendency here uh, to the decline, but suddenly in 2012 we have a positive a rebound here. But that is because the government decided to tighten exchange rate controls that are, uh, we know that are not sustainable in the long run. For example, Argentina during 2012, the government allowed the repatriation of dividends or payment of royalties abroad for uh, in the whole year for uh, about 200 million dollars when in normal times that uh, movement of money was about 400 million dollars a month so they allow in all year half a month of normal times so if you just move uh, adjust the green the green line here for a normal repatriation of dividends it would have been also a small deficit and you all know that on top of that the government introduced 
uh, more and more stringent uh, con uh, regulations that virtually uh, bar the Argentines to buy a, 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 a foreign exchange for saving purposes and also to do tourism abroad. So basically, uh, uh, that um, bonus that we receive uh, from abroad uh, that for some time uh, was, so to speak, uh, prudently quote unquote managed, we lost that in the recent years. Uh, at the same time that uh, this happened, uh, this is the evolution of the reserves of the central bank, that is uh, assets accumulated in the past. You have three lines there. The, the first line on the top, the blue line, is what the government publishes every, every day, which is the reserves of the financial system. This is measured in billion dollars. Uh, but those are the reserves of the financial system, not the reserves of the central bank, because they count as reserves, and that's okay, uh, the reserve requirements of the dollar-denominated deposits in Argentine, in, in banks located in Argentina. When you subtract those reserve requirements, they, you, you get the orange line. But on top of that, the central bank has uh, some liabilities denominated in foreign currency, especially with the Bank of France. So basically, when you deduct that, you have a better <coughs> estimate of the uh, assets the, uh, of free disposal that the central bank has. And you see that uh, they are uh, about $28 billion, okay? not the $40 billion that the government uh, uh, publishes uh, every, every, every day. Uh, the other thing that you see in the graph, this, which is this bar here, is the day when the government decided to introduce more severe exchange rate controls, uh, probably with the idea to prevent a decline in reserves. As you see there, in any of the three lines, you can see that they were not very effective because the central bank lost, since the uh, end of October uh, 2011, about $5 billion of reserves. Basically, because in my view, they underestimated the response of the private sector. Uh, anyone that uh, today, uh, in the past, was ready to sell some foreign exchange to the central bank to get pesos, today is trying to avoid that because there is a, a black market premium or a premium with a, what is called the contado con liqui, which is a kind of blue chip that is legal. And obviously, that trades with a gap that today is around 70%. So this is just to give you more detail of the evolution of the fiscal position. In red, you have a longer evolution than the one I, sh I showed in the past. Argentina is running a deficit, as I mentioned in the past, 4.5% of GDP. Most of that is federal government. When you include, I am excluding here the central bank and the transfer that the government receives from the pension system that, in my view, should be considered as financing of the deficit because they are not uh, a genuine source of income. You see that in the past, we also had periods of much larger deficits that here that we are financed with money printing, as we are in part doing uh, today. But uh, this, again, is uh, something that is, uh, in my view, very uh, imprudent compared to what should take into consideration the ex ex spectacular external conditions that the country is enjoying. Uh, let me tell you, uh, well, this is to show uh, in perspective uh, that uh, the uh, high growth and this external bonus uh, allow the revenues that the government receives in Argentina to increase a lot, 13 points of GDP. There are also other countries, for example, Ecuador or Bolivia, that enjoy in the period 2000 to 12 a very large boom. In the case of Argentina, we spent, the government spent the whole thing, okay? So more on that. And so that's the reason why we are back to a deficit that in a sense is, in fact, is higher, one point higher than it used to be in the year 2000. It's true that the debt of Argentina is relatively low because this is the gross public debt. Part of that debt is held by the central bank and by the pension system. When you exclude that, uh, the debt held by the private sector and the multilateral agencies is about 20% of GDP. But in any case, this flow dimension with a deficit in spite of this boom in terms of uh, revenues is, as I mentioned before, uh, has not been very prudent. So. Uh, Argentina has a fiscal problem that needs to be fixed uh, at some point uh, uh, in the future. Let me move uh, now uh, to uh, basically what we uh, see is that uh, in Argentina, well, the government since 2003 adopted, uh, I would say, uh, economic policies that are non-mainstream, so to speak. 
or queer economic policies. But uh, for a time, for, uh, as, uh, as the government had a surplus and dollars uh, flows into the economy were abundant trade flows, uh, the people was relatively uh, calm. And the other thing is that Argentina was very cheap uh, in dollar terms because we had, uh, as you remember well, uh, a very sharp devaluation in, in 2002, and so Argentina was very cheap in dollars. But that belongs to the past because in the last uh, six or seven years, here is how you measure that uh, here in the US, this is the bilateral real exchange rate of uh, Argentina and several other countries in the region, and you see that taking into consideration true inflation, not the government inflation, but inf inflation estimated by, by, by uh, private sources, you see that the peso is the, economy, is the uh, currency that uh, extended the most in the region. So if we mention in the Latin American way, which is the reverse of this, the peso appreciated 40% in real terms since 2006. So uh, what provided CALM, that is the fiscal surplus, the current account surplus, and a very cheap currency, all the three things are gone. We are, have now a fiscal deficit, a current account that is imbalanced because of the controls that are not sustainable in the long term, and uh, Argentina is no longer cheap in dollar terms, uh, and probably the, ca the, the currency is a little bit overvalued. That has created problems uh, that is, uh, firms used to enjoy high profits. We can follow, uh, uh, there are not many public companies in Argentina, listed companies, where you can get access to financial information. Here in the graph, what you have is a group of about 35 firms that do not include banks, oil companies, and utilities. Utilities for the reason that Santiago was mentioning, oil companies because they are a special creature, as the same like banks. So basically, the sample that we have here is a group of, as I say, it's about 35 companies that are basically manufacturing. And you see a very popular ratio that can be followed. There are not, not all these companies have uh, information about profits, uh, but you can follow the bid, which is the earnings before interest and taxes, as a fraction of sales, and you see that in the last four or, f uh, four or, f uh, four or five years, this ratio, regardless if you look at the simple average of the ratio of each company or a weighted average by sales, has declined and they have lost about five points. So, um, stronger currency and less uh, dynamism in growth has clearly affected the profitability of the private sector in Argentina, in the tradable sector, uh, in, and in manufacturing in particular. And uh, as Juan Luis uh, showed, uh, manufacturing had a, a poor performance in terms of growth in the last uh, four or five years. So, uh, let me conclude with uh, what we... Uh, think uh, it's going to happen this year. I always mentioned that in passing, but what you see there is that uh, Argentina last year uh, had a very poor growth performance. The economy grew less than 1%. But in any case, there was something uh, queer in, in, the, in the data. Usually in the past, in Argentina, investment, as in most countries, tends to amplify the economic cycle. As you see that in the previous years, when Argentina had a boom in 2010 and 2011, this is a different scale. Okay, the investment is measured in red. It's about three times the scale here than, than here. So investment, when the economy grew like 10%, investment grew like 20% in real terms. And the same happens in 2011. Uh, investment double or triple the, the rate of growth of GDP. Last year, in spite of positive growth, it was very low, but positive investment contracted like five points. And why? Well, again, uh, for reasons that... Uh, Santiago mentioned that the business climate is not the best, not only in utilities, but also in other activities in Argentina with price controls, uh, exchange rate controls, and also because profitability, as I mentioned, as I showed before, has been declining, and we are expecting that to be the same case this year, even though we are expecting the economy to grow uh, close to 2% because of the recovery in the crop and uh, a better outlook in, in the Brazilian economy and still with a relatively good uh, export price in spite of some decline that uh, Juan Ruiz mentioned, we think that the investment is not, be, is not going to be very, uh, very attractive in Argentina, and so uh, we are uh, expecting growth to be uh, only 2%. And consumption, as Juan Ruiz mentioned, with the wage bill uh, virtually paralyzed in real terms, is not going to provide much impulse either. So uh, that's uh, what we think is going to happen, and uh, we are ready to the Q&A.
the session. So with that, we open up the floor up to questions. If you could please identify yourself before asking your question. Who is first? Go ahead. Please turn the mic on. There you go. Uh, yes, thanks for um, this really elucidating presentation. Uh, I'm Michael Sherry. I write for Barron's here in New York. Um, I was wondering if you could put um, these, <coughs> sorry, concerns that you have about the Argentine economy and you know the, the scenarios that you've kind of penciled out uh, in context with um, your views on other economies in Latin America. I mean, just hypothetically, Brazil or Chile, and uh, if you could sort of compare them for us, what you think the concerns are there and. Uh, what your, you know, uh, tentative scenarios for those economies might be compared with Argentina? Well, uh, if you, I don't know if you are more focused in the short term or in the long term, but let me provide you a long term perspective, which is uh, what makes the difference for a generation that is, uh, when you look at growth in the, in the, in the long-term perspective, you care about basically two things, uh, productivity and investment. Productivity, uh, which w is what we focus is in total factor productivity, the combined productivity of labor and capital. With the same labor and capital, you can do more, or you can do the same with less labor and capital. And investment, because it tends to amplify the capital stock. Uh, there is a lot of debate in the world about uh, what is more important, and the, in the in Asian economies they have been discussing a lot about if TFP would make the difference or they invest uh, like hell, which is the case in China, they invest like 40-50%. Uh, you know that in Latin America we are not champions of investment. Investment in Latin America used to be 20-25% of GDP. Why I made this introduction? Because when we try to focus, look at... Uh, in, in economies in the region that are supposed to do well in the medium term, I include in that group clearly Peru, Colombia, and Chile. Uh, they are the ones who invest more in the region and the ones who have uh, better regulation in terms of all the micro things that help to uh, improve productivity. Obviously, they have a lot of problems. There is a lot of problem of poverty in Colombia. In Peru, a similar case. Chile is slightly better in that dimension. There are many things, but I would say that if you look at investment and productivity, uh, they should do well in those three economies. And that, I would say, are economies that may grow 5-6% in real terms in the next decade or so. Then you have another group uh, where investment is not uh, as, uh, as uh, impressive and where productivity gains have been impaired by a delay in the micro reforms or the structural reforms. And the example there are two big economies in the region, uh, I would say are Brazil and Mexico. Okay? Uh, Brazil and Mexico have been showing uh, relatively low investment ratios. In the case of Mexico, you know that the new government is trying to push a very ambitious reform agenda in terms and trying to foster productivity and trying to foster also investment in areas that were reserved for the public sector. In the, both countries enjoy a very important uh, improvement in the macroeconomic uh, behavior, that is, they, they are stable economies with relatively low inflation, uh, the government is solvent, and so on and so forth. That is good but that's not enough. All the other three economies that I mentioned before achieve also that, but they make a difference in terms of the microeconomic reforms that I was mentioning. And Argentina, so let me tell you, well, we, I don't know if Mexico will be able to move ahead that very ambitious reform agenda, but in the case of Brazil, I would say that they are able to grow about three, three and a half percent in real terms. Uh, from now on, given that they uh, we are not able to solve that uh, that uh, investment cum productivity puzzle property. Uh, in the case of Brazil, I would add that Brazil has a very large government participation in the economy, and that the government basically spends in wages and pensions, not much on infrastructure. Excuse me. Very large government participation in the economy. Uh, and the government in Brazil is not particularly very efficient. And then let me tell about Argentina. As I mentioned, investment, we are not expecting investment to be dynamic with these uh, conditions. 
We have the highest uh, state participation in the economy in the region. We used to be much lower than Brazil, but now we are number one. We beat the Brazilians, after, at least in one dimension. We finance that with crazy taxes, and we spend basically in pensions and wages, not much on infrastructure. So, uh, and in the micro reforms, structural reforms, uh, we did many things uh, about 20 years ago. Some were done poorly, some they were more effective, but this government has managed to reverse, especially the reforms that were properly done, for example, in the energy sector. So, uh, Argentina's uh, performance depends uh, a lot on, on luck uh, and uh, uh, if I had to bet uh, where we were going to be, we are going to be closer to the Brazilian group than to the uh, Peru, Chile, and Colombia group. Then we can discuss the other smaller economies and obviously leave aside Venezuela because it's a special case of the large economies. Okay? Question here. Okay. Yes. Um, Hi, uh, Ignacio Ruiz from Moody's. Um, my question is kind of connected to the previous question. Um, and I know uh, Urbistondo tried to stay away from uh, estimating the cost of getting out of a situation like this, but I'm still going to ask. Um, excluding a, an exit in 2015 a la Putin for Argentina, uh, what, I mean, if you want to think of going back to some normal um, potential or close to some potential GDP growth uh, for the country, what, what would be an, an estimate of the or a range for the annual investment needs um, for you know, this period of time to go back to some normalcy? Uh, is there such a thing that isn't? But you mean in infrastructure in general? <coughs> I'm thinking in general, but infrastructure clearly is... is I'm sure that uh, Santiago may add something on the regulatory front, but uh, investment in Argentina, you know, picked at some point in time 24% uh, of GDP, which was uh, a combination of high investment in construction, but also high investment in machinery and equipment. But that was lost because of all the deterioration in the macroeconomic performance. And the situation in the, in, in the microeconomic reforms and also in the macroeconomic picture deteriorated a lot. So the micro, the macro uh, conditions are, seen, are easily, are, 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 can be reformed or improved easier than the micro reforms, okay? Because to get rid of all those subsidies that uh, Santiago was telling is gonna be a long-term process. So in, I would say Argentina oil investment is running at about 21% of GDP. That's not bad, but that's not enough to go at a pace that is higher than 3% if we solve other things, because now uh, we added other ingredients to the cocktail. It's not just a cocktail of TFP and investment. Just that I tried to answer his question looking at the long-term perspective comparing with other countries. When you look at the short-term dynamics, we have more problems in Argentina and the other economies that I mentioned. Okay, but that is something. It's another question. <laughs> we can discuss that later. I don't know if... Uh, so we're going to take the three questions together. One, two, and three. Or Santiago, did you have something to add? And then we'll take questions. Uh, quantitatively, uh, the, the investment uh, has, last decade, been lower, adding up uh, public and private than, than the previous decade. But the problem is not the quantity of investment at all. Uh, it's the quality of investment. So in the longer term, the, um, the amount of resources directed towards investment in infrastructure might increase a bit regarding what it is now, but the big question is whether we can reach the higher efficiency in those investments. We'll take the three questions together first. Uh, good morning. My name is Tyler. I'm a Please writer. turn your microphone on. Turn it around. It has to on microphone. Well, we'll lend it to you. Good morning, my name is Tyler, and uh, I'm a Global Energy MBA student at Columbia. The question I have is in terms of economic development, increased competitiveness, um, more in terms of entrepreneurship. You, Chile has Startup Chile happening in Santiago, where they're giving $40,000 for people to sort of relocate and establishing a hub in Santiago for more clean tech and you know different ventures. Brazil has Startup Brazil, where they're offering 200,000 reais. I'm just curious for Argentina in terms of economic development for small business and entrepreneurs, what economic development policies or 
maybe they're not in place now, but what you're thinking about? The second question. Yes, uh, this is John Camacho from JAC Strategic Advisors. My question is this. Uh, the foreign direct investment in Argentina has been declining. Uh, it has been more pronounced ever since the nationalization of Repsol. What is the government about to do to reverse that? And what do you guys think should be done to reverse this? There's a third question. Good morning. My name is Marcelo Echevarne, partner at Cabanelas Echevarne Kelly. My question is, uh, if Argentina gets an adverse ruling on the Parik Basu case within the next two months and the court denies a stay pending appeal, mean, meaning that Argentina uh, ends up being unable to pay the bonds that participated in the 05 and the 2010 exchanges, uh, what would be the impact in the economy, if any? And there's a fourth question. <clears throat> Hi, Rafael Matus from La Nación. I was going to ask about Paripaso, but I have another question. Uh, do you see any other way to correct the imbalances that you have pointed out uh, that is not a strong devaluation of the currency? Because there has been a lot of rumors in Argentina about that. Fifth question down here. Hi, Daniel Volberg from Morgan Stanley. I have a question that basically there are some real impediments to growth in terms of uh, economic policy, like what Santiago has mentioned in terms of utilities, uh, business climate, etc. Uh, you can you can deal with the real impediments to growth, or you can do a, a nominal adjustment, namely the devaluation. What would, uh, how would you sort of differentiate between sort of real adjustments versus nominal adjustment, and what could be the consequences? Um, I'll go to your question on, on the energy uh, uh, fall in production. Well, it's um, it's been a year since uh, we, we we were actually here uh, exactly a year ago on, on at the time of the YBF uh, nationalization and um, things we were pretty much as we depicted in terms of scenarios, not precisely on forecast, but on, on scenarios actually. The, the, the production was still falling and is still uh, falling down, and the management in YPF is at um, the difficult times to stabilize that in the short term. There is a program working for the, for the medium term, but as, as we said a year ago, it's uh, some years and many, many billions of dollars ahead. And I would, I, I, last year I said, I, and many institutions ahead, and that, that's the problem. Um, the government, what the government is doing is trying to put all the, the, the eggs in, in the same basket, which means the, the, the program of YBF. That's the, the, the central, the core of the, of the strategy now. Uh, the strategy is, is working, trying to uh, soften the constraints on the, on the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the energy sector. That's why the accident we had two weeks ago in, in one facility in, in La Plata uh, was, uh, was a tremendous setback for, 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 for this strategy for the medium term. But in the meantime, there is no other uh, pos uh, scenario that I can imagine of a, of a, s a, a continuous reduction, in, in, in particularly natural gas production. Uh, the government came with, a, with, a, with, with, with one innovation in terms of prices, which w was to uh, pass a resolution uh, in January so as to give uh, new price incentives for natural gas, I mean, the new, new, new gas in terms of conventional or, or even non-conventional, uh, com particularly non-conventional, but even conventional, conventional gas to amplify the range of the, of the incentives the, the energy sector would, would set through a, through a mechanism which is relatively short-sighted, I mean, in terms of five years plans and, and no, no more than that. The problem with that announcement is that the, the prices being announced in the, in the, in the new uh, uh, resolution 
are prices that the government is supposed to give to producers for new uh, uh, discoveries or new production of gas. But it, is, it says nothing at all on how this, who is going to pay <laughs> that. So there is no correspondence with demand actually paying the thing. And that's the central problem of the thing. Is you, if you don't uh, say uh, how demand is going to pay uh, the, for, for, the, for the higher prices, and if you look looking at the at the at the anatomy or or the this, uh, all, all the structure of prices in natural gas sector, you see that the the, the gap with the, in, in relation with opportunity costs is is huge. I mean, demand is actually paying a big segment of demand is actually paying less than ten times uh, one tenth of the of the of the actual of the actual cost. So you have a huge gap. This problem is now now I mean in two of 13, compounded by the problem of the real exchange uh, movements. Why? Because if you are in an economy where the economy will have to move towards a, a, a movement in the exchange rate, that creates more and more problems for the energy imbalances because uh, prices are uh, set at international value. So the, the, there is a, now a problem compounded by the, by, the, by the thing. So what would be our... our, our um, Recommendation: it, Well, you, you need to start from the beginning and go back to uh, setting institutions in a correct way. Uh, try to unify the energy policy. Now we have a, an energy policy which is a is a monster of of two heads or three heads, and even even the heads are not in in good. Uh, uh, Situation with, between between each other. So you have a, you have the Ministry of Planning. You have the uh, the, the Vice Ministry of the Economy the, taking decisions. You have the the, the Secretary of the Commerce uh, 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 freezing prices, and uh, so you had to reunify the, the the energy policies. Go back to principles. Set institutions. Create conditions for the credibility. I mean, the crucial thing here. If you want, if you want to give uh, incentives for new discoveries of energy, you have to give cre you have to give credible signals that the uh, promises you are making in terms of new prices are going to be there at the time the gas is going to be delivered or the en new energy is going to be delivered. Otherwise, if you cannot commit yourself, you are in a very very big I mean a big problem. Um, close to nil. At the, at the, at in, the, in the current situation, with the given, with, I mean, was uh, was related to the to, to the first question on 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 Argentina against uh, other Latin American countries. Uh, if you, you you read last last uh, month, we have two documents: one by the World Bank, another by by the IDB, on the perspectives of uh, of the situation in Latin America in general. All pointing to the need to uh, look at the conditions, macroeconomic conditions, they need to push for reforms in the fiscal area or in the infrastructure and, and competitive, uh, competitive uh, areas. The thing in Argentina, the problem in Argentina is the policy reaction function, okay? Is that we, didn't, we don't know, actually, it's, 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 uh, what the policy reaction function is going to be under uh, circumstances where the macroeconomic uh, scenario may deteriorate. And that makes the thing, well, actually, we, we, what we know is not good, I mean, in terms of, of the actual disclosure of, of, of new policies. So I, I think this, this will be more of the same. The only card the government has today is the, is the YPF program. But even the YPF co uh, program uh, now is, uh, has some risks of uh, even, I mean, having the uh, staying with the same uh, CEO and the, and the same team if things do not as expected. Let me uh, go briefly. Um, I think the first question I think was about if there are any specific policies for a s a small and medium sized firms. Uh, well, in fact, not much, but anyway, the, the government, for example, last year decided to uh, force the banks to lend uh, the equivalent of 5% of their assets uh, for investment at subsidized rates because those loans uh, were forced at 15% in nominal terms and there are three-year loans which are uh, longer maturity and a much lower interest cost than which is what was available in the market and 50% of that money has to be allocated to a small and, and medium-sized medium 
uh, firms. Then you have other general things that tend to favor manufacturing, like uh, in the short term, no? that is like tariffs or restrictions to import, and in my view, are very negative for the long term, but that's uh, another discussion. So in terms of specific polytend, you have other problems of uh, small firms, uh, but basically the novelty was that uh, program for financing that uh, was uh, obviously the firms were eager to get that uh, the, uh, because uh, the, the, the terms of the loans were very favorable. Then uh, the third question about the, the impact on the economy of a negative ruling in, 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 in the case uh, the, uh, with the related to the debt. Well, uh, there are several possibilities. I think that the, your question focuses on the possibility that Argentina loses and uh, the decision of the chamber does not make any change regardless to the intermediaries like Boni and, and, D, and DTC, so uh, the, Argentina enters by definition into technical default because they cannot get a way out to pay, even though the president has committed to make the payments to the uh, people who accepted the swaps, because you need some time to find an alternative route. What I'm saying, as you can, uh, is, the, is the government going to comply with the ruling? Well, I don't know, suppose not. So which is the damage for the economy? Well, uh, if Argentina is in content of a decision of a U.S. court, that was my understanding, it's the first time I want to be in that position, that can uh, damage cross-border flows uh, in addition to what they have suffered uh, last year. So uh, there might be a, a higher cost uh, for the private sector or for provinces who wanted to issue debt. It is true that today uh, for Argentina's firms and provinces it's very expensive to issue debt, so most of the damage of that thing has already been priced in. Uh, so the additional negative effect in the short term, uh, I don't think it's going to be much relevant for the economy, although there will be one. In the long term, it's very difficult to make an assessment, but it's going to be negative because being in contempt with the decision of a court where the government decided to accept to litigate, and at the end, when if Argentina loses, they don't accept the ruling, is a kind of thing that for me is difficult to evaluate. It, from a quantitative point of view, but it is clearly negative for long-term in investment decisions. Obviously, as you know well, because you're an expert on that, uh, Marcelo, there are many options there, because it can be that Argentina loses, but uh, they change the decision on, on, on the intermediaries. It can be that Argentina can find an alternative route, so we can be in technical default for a while, but at the same trying to pay. It's gonna, there are many options there. And I don't know if, we, if you want to discuss, but for the economy, obviously, if Argentina loses and does not comply with the ruling, there will be some negative effect, although most of that effect, in my view, has been priced in. Obviously, if Argentina wins, which I think that most people are saying a very, very low probability to that, the upside is very high, because you should go back to a country's level that is not much different than the one we had before. Jack Grecia took the decision, which is about 300 points less than today, although the probability of that, as many people believe, is very small. Then I will try to get together the last two questions. Uh, uh, the first thing that I want to say is that uh, the same thing that happens in the 90s in Argentina is always better to prevent those things to happen. That is, uh, it's not the same to act, uh, to try to avoid the problem, than try to act after you have the problem, okay? So uh, what we had in Argentina today is something that is very similar to what we had in the 90s, a different degrees of, uh, of, of problem, but uh, especially uh, the fiscal policy was inconsistent with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the exchange rate policy that the government was adopting. In the 90s, it was more severe, the inconsistency, but today, you know, if you are the depreciating the currency at 8% for a while, as what Luis was showing, and you are expanding government expenditure at 35%, at some point in time, you have a problem. So the problem is not today. The problem was created some years ago, okay? Now, when you are in the, in the middle of the problem, the question is how you get out of there, okay? And you can get out of there, uh, well, you have to improve the fiscal position of the government, and probably Argentina ends, will need to accelerate the, the depreciation pass. If you don't do both things and you only depreciate the currency, you only get more inflation. That is, is depreciation is just one instrument, ingredient with, together with other ingredients that are necessary to, to clean uh, the macroeconomic imbalances. And obviously, if Argentina were able to add to that uh, 
reforms and other things that uh, enable growth or facilitate growth, uh, the chances that that will be successful increase. Now, uh, a more specific comment to Daniel's uh, point is that uh, you cannot gain competitiveness, and you know that well, and uh, through devaluation. But the devaluation sometimes is necessary to align, to correct these distortions that were created in the past. But as I mentioned before, devaluation alone cannot do much. So, uh, to summarize, uh, the mistakes uh, were committed in the past and also today, but <laughs> they started many years ago. And uh, the government has an option in 2011 to correct them. They decided to tighten controls only to aggravate the problem that they have to solve. So if, you don't, if Argentina does not have more luck in the, in the near future, at some point in time, a correction will be necessary, which means that, that's different than saying that the correction will have to take place after the midterm elections in 2013. Okay, that's a different point. But at some point in time, we'll need to regain some consistency in the macroeconomic variables. And with that, the program comes to a close. Thank you very much, Fernando, Santiago, Juan Luis, and Daniel. And we look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you very much.